so we're going to look at Jacques Derrida and um, his, the movement that he best represents called deconstruction. And this is his best known work of grammatology, uh, which I'm not going to plow my way through because it is in the translation 300 odd pages. Um, I am going to focus on his critique of logocentrism and try and represent what that entails and we're going to come at that specifically through the reading uh, of his uh, pharmacos or uh, pharmacy is the way it's usually translated which is a him commenting on the myth that's presented in Plato's Phaedrus uh, about the danger of writing for memory etc. Um, so we'll use that as a means of discussing the entirety of the, and the, the trajectory of Derrida's thought here. But let me just begin with just questions related to deconstruction. Because when you ask what deconstruction is, there are a whole uh, multitude of answers. One of them is that it's a way of doing philosophy. Some see it as a way of reading texts, a theory. Uh, some think it's a, just a fashionable uh, approach and has passed its best before date now and is no longer used. R.V. Young says that that's the view in the academy. Uh, some think that it's a, a recapitulation of skepticism and irrationalism. Uh, some see it as a dead end, the dead end outcome of ideas that began in German idealism, which I think is a little bit perhaps closer. Uh, some see it as a neo-Heideggerianism. Heidegger is by Derrida cited as his formative influence, his idea of language being the house of being, etc. Uh, some see it as an ethical response to a complacent establishment. Uh, some see it as a sustained assault on the Western philosophical tradition. And more recently, some see it as a, an attack on Christianity, very popular in our day, uh, I understand, to talk about the deconstruction of the Christian faith. People are speaking of walking away from the faith, having deconstructed it, etc. So I'm going to try and not be able to address all of those things here because that's impossible, but the deconstruction is a very widely used term with all manner of perceptions to it. And um, what it's clear Derrida's writing does do is that he does question, if not undermine, all of our usual ideas about texts and meanings and concepts and identities. And that's not just in the field of literary study, but uh, across all sorts of disciplines. Um, and that is because uh, the human sciences, which I think are, as I've said last time, um, the, the root of this whole uh, move towards an anti-logocentrism um, encompasses a wide array of fields and pretty much every realm of thought is subject to this and including theology. And so we see in this little cartoon that I've got behind me, that's Derrida there with his famous shock of white hair. Um, uh, and the critique from the philosophers that he's, he's effectively promoting irrationalism, attacking reason, to which Derrida responds, um, you know, and wh what's wrong with reason and what does it have to do with presence? And then his response is reason has been shaped by a dishonest pursuit of certainty, which I have diagnosed as logocentrism, the guarantee of the word made flesh. Now the pursuit of certainty through philosophy you could argue begins with, with, with Descartes, actually. The radical doubt of Descartes is uh, the beginning of the problem of radically skeptical ideas in Western philosophy that are going to go so deep that it will not accept the authority of the word at all. It's going to require us to doubt all things and on the basis of the certitude of experience to establish facts. And facts never actually add up to certainty, they add up to probabilities. 
because it's the, it's the connection of the facts which l leads to a more sound basis on which to make broader claims about the world. But those claims can, in turn, by the scientific method, be overturned with a new theory that explains the facts better. And that's how we get uh, shifts from one view of science to the next that we observe since the scientific revolution. So it's never the fact that the method of certainty that Descartes uh, initiates actually leads to truth, it leads to perhaps more probable outcomes. And um, one of the uh, mythologies of science and the methodology of science is that it brought about uh, truth. And I'm not sure that it ever actually did do that. It brought about probability uh, and perhaps better and more accurate probability, but, uh, but probability nonetheless. But that's a little bit off topic. Uh, here we can see in, in the words given to Descartes here, the trajectory that's going to concern Christians. And I think at heart of the whole endeavor here is that his critique of logocentrism uh, refers to a, a Christian tradition of thought, uh, which we can see in John's Gospel, where it states that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in John 1, 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, and what, hap what happens in John's Gospel is that we, it refers to a pre-existent personified Logos, pre-incarnate, and you can take De Derrida's privileging of the uh, of the of the non-written word, the non-material word over the written word in that articulation of John's Gospel. He was with God in the beginning, before all things were created. He was, and all things were created by him and for him, and without him, nothing was made that's been made. So it's that reference to a pre-written pre word that he says is at the heart of the theological tradition. And he'll, as I said last time, he will cite the same thing in the discussion of Plato and his idea that we have, uh, we privilege uh, language or voice over texts. And he will use the pharmacy, his discussion of the Phaedrus, to demonstrate, and that's what I'm going to focus on here, but it has Christian theological uh, consequences that I think we should not ignore. They are definitely there. And he is going to suggest that we can't conclude from a text like John's Gospel, or this is the implication of this, that we cannot conclude a transcendental signified. All we have is a, a, sig a signifier pointing to other signifiers that can never refer back to the pre-incarnate logos. We just have words on a page. And the emphasis on something that language refers to outside of experience, Derrida says is impossible because there is no access to reality outside of the text. And the text he, pre he presents in terms of writing. And he's going to emphasize the authority of writing over uh, thought and expression. Uh, that's the, so I think it is to some degree uh, can be seen as a direct assault on, uh, on the Christian faith insofar as words cannot refer to philosophical concepts like being let alone the being of God. So it has, it has been received as um, rather badly within the academy by those who are philosophers, by those who are Christians, by those who regard the academic enterprise to be engaging in any sense with truth or with metaphysics. It's a radical attack on metaphysics and a radical, radical critique of philosophy. Derrida's argument is that philosophy is first and foremost writing. 
And so it depends on styles and forms of language, figures of speech, metaphors, even layout on the page, just like literature does. And he can point, as we will see here today, uh, Plato regularly appeals to myths and so forth, and, and illustrations and figures of speech like the allegory of the cave to make his points. But these are, are uh, figures of speech and metaphors that are no different than literature, and so the critique that Plato makes of the poets equally applies to the philosophers. They have the same problem here, uh, that they can't actually get to the realm of certainty, of truth, of being, um, because they're trapped in the prison house of language that doesn't allow them, if you want to see it like the prisoners, where those prisoners are the human condition that we can't escape. And we, and we can't escape it because we access it through writing, all, always, in both cases. So when Derrida writes philosophy, and as I say, my colleagues in philosophy get angry at the very thought that Derrida is a philosopher, but in, in, in literary studies, they'll get angry at the very thought, thought that he is uh, interested in literature. Because in both cases, they say he misunderstands or misrepresents the issues that um, we are talking about. He wholly misrepresents them uh, for his own purposes. And um, I think that's true. He, he does mis misrepresent them. The question is whether his case actually is valid in any way, even on his own uh, terms. So how do we read this? Um, well, one of the things that is interesting about this is, um, is his engagement with uh, features of the 20th century. A and one of the things that I, I found really interesting myself about Derrida is his comments on uh, the idea that emerged in the 1920s, the late 1920s of the, of the, of the zombie. It's called White, there's a film called White Zombie. And it talks about white science meeting black magic. And, and, and that idea is still there in the academy. I think this idea that science is a white or European or logocentric or rationalist um, myth that presents itself as being a non-myth, as being a version of a reality that confronts black magic and disparages it as if it were different, fundamentally different. And Derrida's point is because they're both uh, forms of writing, are the differences really as black and white as are being portrayed. Um, and the myth of the zombie is, is a, an encounter where the usual categories don't apply. So a zombie, as we all know, is a dead person that walks around. <clears throat> and you can't kill a zombie because the zombie's already dead. So the categories of life and death, which are usually seen as you are either a, a one or a zero, you're alive or you're dead, don't apply here because the zombie is dead and yet walks around and is alive. And with this, um, we see that um, a crisis <coughs> perceived within the humanities themselves being illustrated in front of us on, uh, on film. And zombie films are very popular in our day as well. I mean, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be alive? What, is, what does it mean to be dead? <coughs> and the zombie act occupies an uncertain space between the two. You could say that it's alive. You could say that it's dead. The truth is that it can be both alive and dead. So it's the blurring of the categories, which were previously conceived as mutually exclusive. If you're dead, you can't be alive. And those categories are central to Western metaphysics, not just to Christian theology. It's important for Christian theology that Jesus died and that he was raised and he's alive. That uh, 
sharp contrast, that those two things being mutually exclusive, one being impossible, you can't have a category of somebody who's dead that is now alive. And that hence the miracle of the resurrection and the importance of the resurrection. Somebody who was dead is now alive. That doesn't happen. But the zombie suggests uh, a conception where uh, these boundaries are, it's not that one is contradicted, it's that the two are not mutually exclusive. Sort of a shadow lands. And so it represents something that Derrida calls the undecidable. Uh, which is that existence is not merely to be maintained in terms of um, contradictions. I think I'm, this is probably irrelevant here for now. I think it is. I've just taken these from a comic book version of postmodernism, which I find kind of funny, but I'm not following them in my lecture, so I should probably just dispense with it here. Uh, but the idea of the oppositions of, of life and death, of true and false, of right and left, of east and west, of male and female, of mind and body, of inside and outside, of positive and negative, of uh, present and past, of alive and dead, these oppositions depend on the idea fundamentally of logical contradictions. The one cannot be the other. So it's rooted in an idea of reality that is um, described by what we call logic. And there are laws of logic. Um, and we find the zombie fascinating precisely because it contradicts reason. It wholly contradicts it. It's irrational, this is not possible. And yet portrayed. And so one of the questions is why is this idea being presented in cinema, and why does it hold such a fascination over the public that people watch zombie movies? Um, that's another question. But fundamentally, it questions the idea of truth in relation to being. And if you want to look at Aquinas's philosophy, He's going to cite being as the centerpiece of his whole oeuvre, being. And in terms of good and evil, the Christian conception of evil is that evil is the absence of the good, the absence of being, being being a good. So evil is non-existent. But what if in this conception, good and evil are, the categories are not as clear it cut as they are portrayed. What if evil exists? What if death exists? That's the question. So uh, Derrida raises this and, and he uses the language or the theory of language presented by Ferdinand de Saussure, Ferdinand de Saussure and his systems of signs. Remember the binary way in which these categories are played out, or the words are played out, are determined not in relation to things, but rather in relation to other signs. We have other signs and we have a signifier by that. Uh, Derrida reconfigures this as a sign referring to another sign. And thereby in the contrast, let's say between high and low or black and white or good and evil or male and female, that's what we mean by a Let's say a female. Female is a non-male or isn't a male. If you're a female, you can't be a male. If you're dead, you can't be alive. Right? If you're on the inside of a room, you can't be outside of the room. If you're up there, you can't be down here. These are exclusive and if they don't have that exclusive meaning, they don't mean anything. And they mean things in relation to one another then. We require the opposite in order to explain and clarify what we mean by a, a certain category. And you could actually visually demonstrate that then. But again, what if the categories are not actually anything other than signs to indicate something that actually has no being, it just refers to another sign to clarify what it means. 
and the zombie to some degree, even though it's not seen in usually as any relation to uh, this uh, to literary theory, I think is an, is an illustration of the concern in language in the universities, in language, that language actually, and this project goes back all the way to the 18th century, as I said, that language is something that we determine and we understand and we understand about ourselves. And it's, to me, it's a downstream consequence from that initial hypothesis or rather attempt to understand humanity scientifically. And we'll look at language as the distinguishing feature of humanity and look at it as human beings and try and understand what language is. And as I said, it can go in one of two directions. You can understand as language as an expression of our ideas, or you can refer to language as an expression of our feelings. And one is more rational and has no incarnate form, if you will. <laughs> and the other has a very tangible form our feelings, sensation, but it has no rationality to it. And that interplay between the Enlightenment and, and uh, the Romantic period where each emphasizes the opposite side is in relation to our understanding what language d delivers to us. That's my hypothesis. And I don't see, I think it's rather persuasive, but then I guess I would, it's my hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> and results in the ensuing challenge that I think uh, comes about because of this, which is that we have notions that perhaps God is not alive. How do we know that God exists? How do we know, as it says in John's Gospel, the Word came flesh and dwelt among us? It says that in the text, for sure. And that's the central, uh, the central uh, story of Christianity, really, is the event at the cross as well as the incarnation, the mysteries of the faith that are, and, and if the cross and Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we're worse than, to be more pity than any other man, if that's not true. And notions of truth and falsehood in relation to death and, and life are, are central to the Christian faith. But what if it is that we can't know that because the text never gets to those sorts of issues? Ever. It can't. It's not that this particular text is uh, plagued by this, but all texts are. So Derrida argues that that is in fact the case. All texts are plagued by this fundamental problem um, of writing, and they get away from the problem by asserting logocentrism. We think there's something more central to human life than what we can write about it. We can conclude that somebody has intentions. We can include that, conclude that God exists. We can conclude that we exist. You know, ontology is the, maybe the key philosophical enterprise. And metaphysics, th these are central to Western philosophy. Um, he says the reason they uh, come to that conclusion is because of the logocentrism. So what does he mean by that? What is logocentrism? So I, I suggested that you read uh, Plato's Pharmacy, um, focusing on the Phaedrus. Now, have you read the Phaedrus before? Did you do that? Okay, that's very helpful. Yeah, this is why I like teaching in a institution where they... Uh, where literature students read philosophy and theology, etc., because there's huge overlap and they speak differently on these things. So in Plato's Pharmacy, he focuses on the Phaedrus and a fictionalized uh, conversation between two historical characters. Uh, Socrates on the one hand and Phaedrus on the other. Now Phaedrus, both of them are real individuals, but the dialogue is fictionalized. I mean. It, perhaps took place, but he's written it in a form for us to understand this. And Phaedrus is a young man who has been persuaded by the rhetoricians of his day. And so the topic, oddly, 
uh, for what ends up happening. But the topic begins as uh, discussing the relative merits of the lover versus the non-lover as sexual partners and also as thinkers. That's, and it starts, you think, where is this going? And it's not there. So it starts there, but it doesn't end there. Um, because you could see it, and it probably could also be conceived as the relative merits of rhetoric or philosophy, which is superior. And philosophy is the lover, and rhetoric is the non-lover in that conception. Or you could see it as the various merits of speech versus writing. And to deal with this, he, Socrates proposes that as far as words concerned, saying to his partner here in uh, conversation, Phaedrus, what would most please the gods? Do you know this? He says, I have no idea. Do you know? Well, I can tell you what I've heard. And then the myth comes out. So what's the myth? The, the, the myth is this. They say that there dwelt at Naucratus in Egypt, one of the ancient gods of the country, an inventor god uh, by the name of Thoth. Quite the name. Write it down. It's a non-English. And so Thoth was an inventor, and he invented all manner of things. Very interesting character. He invented... Uh, calculation and geometry and astronomy, which are, you've already named uh, three of the four uh, arts of the quadrivium, right there, uh, as well as dice, but above all he invented writing. So this is a, a, a very interesting ca character in Egyptian mythology. and. At that time, the great god king of all the upper, of Upper Egypt was named was Thamus. So this is the inventor god, and the king, on the other hand, his name is Thamus, Thamus. And Thamus, uh, who the Greeks call Ammon. Um, receives Thoth into his presence and Thoth presents to him all sorts of his inventions and says they ought to be known to the Egyptians. These, these inventions are fantastic and the Egyptians should know them. So he needs the approval of Thamus to accept the inventions. He, this is the, I don't know if it's not the patent office, but it's the one who decides whether it's going to go to market or not. Are you going to let people see this or not? And Thamus inquires into each of the inventions. Um, some of them he just rejects, others he praises, and it, then he comes along to writing. And Thoth says, this branch of learning will make the Egyptians wiser, and it will help them improve their memories, for I've discovered a pharmacon for memory and wisdom. He uses the word pharmacon here, Plato does. So he says that writing is a pharmacon. It will help them improve their memory. It will make them wiser. Now, pharmacon, um, Derrida will bring to our attention, he's correct in this, by the way, uh, is a Greek word that has various and contradictory import. On the one hand, you can see it something like a magic potion. It could be related to a, a recipe. It could also relate to a cure or a remedy. But it's a very ambiguous word, and, and this is what Derrida seizes upon, because it can also be translated as a poison. And that might, or, or in English, a drug. We, we, even in Canada, we tend to talk about them as drug stores, which is interesting because drugs have curative connotations, but they also have connotations of their 
going to make you an addict and they're going to damage your health. And that, that's, that ambiguity is there even in the word drug. Um, but what is important here for Derrida's purposes is that the very term that is used here by Thoyth to promote his invention of writing is he talks about the possibilities that it will do both. But at the same time, he only points to the one side of it. It will improve your memory and it will improve the people's wisdom. And the king, Thamos, rightly says that the one who invents the art is not the best uh, person to judge whether it's harmful or helpful. Because you're promoting your own inventions. And of course, you praise it and say what's good about it. And, uh, and you, the father of writing, are so fond of your offspring that you've stayed the exact opposite of what it's going to do. So Thamus's judgment here is that those who write will stop exercising their memory and they'll become forgetful because they'll rely entirely on external marks of writing instead of their internal capacity to remember. So he conceives it only negatively. One pr perceives it positively, the other conceives it wholly negatively. And so you've what you've developed is a pharmacon for reminding, not for true memory. So yeah, sure, you can have something written and that might remind you, but that's not going to help your memory. In fact, what it will do is it will replace your memory. You'll forget. So you'll say, I can just look it up. I can go to the book in my sh on my library and, and these days I can do a, a, a Google search. Right? And immediately, you know, I know what it means because I do that. But, well, do you know it? Or do you just type in the words into a vast database and you come up with an answer? Well, is the answer the correct answer even? Is it, or is it just the most popular answer? A and is the most popular answer wisdom? Or is it the madness of the crowd that led to a certain outcome? And furthermore, with the tech companies, have, has the whole algorithm been gamed so that you get a certain answer in advance and who benefits from that furthermore. So that, right? So if you, if you want to pres uh, ascribe a, a serious conspiracy theory that the tech companies give you results that will benefit the, the bottom line of the tech companies, which an algorithm can be calibrated to do, then you're not even gonna get the, what, what the people think, you're gonna get what the tech company wants you to think that people think. And it'll be the first item on your search. Okay, but that's got nothing to do with this. It's just an extension of the problem and showing really that Thamos is a concern about this is valid in some ways. And we can see the validity of the concern expressed. And at this point, um, Phaedrus comes in and says, well, actually, um, that sounds rather sound. The objection. And uh, Socrates responds that just like portrait painting, writing is lifeless. It can't answer back when you, answer it when you ask it questions. There's no dialogue. You have a monologue captured in front of you. It says certain things, but it doesn't say other things. It's just what's written down in front of you, and it can't answer questions other than the ones that it's preconceived and wanted you to um, consider to begin with. So, um, so it can't know who it ought to speak to when it's unfairly abused. It can't correct, it's, or it can't correct misreadings even at this point. And so, and, and this is the conclusion of, of the Phaedrus and the, the section of the dialogue. And Derrida's conclusion here is that writing is condemned in the process. Real memory will decline is the conclusion. True education will be corrupted. False knowledge will replace true wisdom. Writing is lifeless and it's orphaned and it's helpless. So writing is rejected in this myth. Right? And so there's an animus against that and he says it's because of logocentrism rather because we privilege uh, the, the spoken word over the written word and this is the mythology that Plato uses to dismiss it but it's just a myth. And note that it does have the ambiguity there and he's decided 
what the important thing is. And the, the important thing is to emphasize memory and wisdom, and it's the wisdom of the philosophers. And writing in, in uh, the conception of Plato is a form of poison then. It, he decides what pharmacon means. Could have been a cure, could have been a poison. The conclusion of Plato is that it's a poison. Why does he do that? The why he does it is, a, is, a, is another question, but um, he will say that the whole Western ph philosophical tradition is involved in this same privileging or the no over the knowledge of the experts over an appeal to their expertise as a, uh, uh, over the things that they want to ignore and purposefully ignore, which are rather ambiguous. Does that make any sense at least, whether you agree with it or not? Now once, now this then introduces, an, an, let me stop here. And,